Lou, thank you so much for being here. Of course. And this is your year. Foreigner finally gets inducted. Well, you're getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Brett Michaels has been continuously showering you with love and respect. And you announced to the world that this is it. You're retiring. This yes. is your last Absolutely. year. So thank you for being here before your show at Mohegan Sun with John Payne, former lead singer of Asia, Steve Ogieri, former lead singer of Journey, and you, Lou Graham, icon of our generation. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Now, the talk, of course, for the last few months has been the Rock Hall induction. <laughs> A lot. It has been in my life. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know that Jan Wenner was removed from the Rock Hall board. Now, for many years, you have said Foreigner is never getting into the Rock Hall because of politics. It's not happening. Jan gets removed. You guys get on the ballot. Do you think it's a coincidence? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't want to say a lot about it. Right. Uh, I don't. I don't know the man and uh, what his views in, in politics are. Uh, all I know is that, that uh, I believe that F Foreigner should have been in, in the Rock Hall for f a number of years ago with our contemporaries. And uh, it, it seemed up until very recently that we were never going to be in the Rock Hall. But the great thing is October 19th is the date. And another question on everyone's mind that we all keep asking and wanting to know is that have you spoken to Mick yet? I have not. You have not. Do you think it'll happen before or do you not? I don't know. I, I speak to um, Foreigner's manager and, and uh, Phil Carson and and, um, and I think it'll happen when it's supposed to happen. That's great. That's great. And I'm sure it, it, I, I just feel like it'll be good. It'll be yeah, a good, I think, positive I think it, I think it will too. experience. I think it will too. Yeah. Now, Brett Michaels, you've been doing the Party Gras tours with him, which, how fun has it's that been? A lot, it's a lot of fun. He, 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 is, a, he is a great band. He's, he's a very nice and personable guy, and, and I enjoy those shows a lot. Now, he has been your biggest advocate, your biggest fan of late. Now, have you guys done, when you were with Foreigner, did you do any shows with Poison? Because I don't recall I don't that so. you did or... Not, not to my knowledge. I don't, unless it was a big festival where mm -hmm. there were six or seven groups, they might, they, you know, we, we might have shared uh, uh, a, a day uh, uh, on a live show, but, but I, I don't, I think I would have recalled. Now, have you had some sit-downs with Brett and he has said to you, listen, I love you because... Uh, yeah, we've had some sit downs. It, it, it hasn't been anything like that, but 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 uh, but 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 uh, he, he's he's he, he's he's a genuinely nice guy, and and uh, he he treats me like gold, and uh, I I enjoy the shows with playing with him and his band. They're they're uh, they're 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 awesome. And, and uh, we always go away with big smiles, laughing and stuff. And, and his, his audiences always have a certain, certain uh, uh, personality to them too, which, which clicks with me. Right, because it, it feels like they're right there with you on that stage singing. Yes. High energy, yep. and, which and, you like that. Yeah, and, and, and Brett is fantastic. And he's getting you to the Rock Hall induction in style, he said. Well, he, he he made an offer, but but um, uh, I I I I thought I was going to have a show the night before the Rock Hall, and, and he offered to fly me in his his personal jet, which I thought was outrageous. Oh, cool. And, and, and uh, uh, I was going to accept, and and we decided that that uh, um, I wanted to be in my best voice possible for the rock hall so so we declined the show the the, the night before and, and i'm driving excellent yeah excellent well you know you and this is a big deal it is now way back near the beginning of your career you were with a group called the black sheep 
That's correct, yep. And you recently did a reunion show with them. I think it was, what, number three in 10 years? Yes, that's right, that's right. And Michael Bonafidi, who owns the club where the reunion took place, it was, it was actually, a sold out show, it was right? actually an old theater uh, uh, that was built in the late 1800s. Wow. That, that he bought, because they were ready to tear it down, he bought it and wow. he, he began to restore it. And it, it's, a, it's potentially a beautiful, beautiful place. That's awesome. Now, what is it like going from, you know, working with such a huge band as Foreigner, doing your solo career, now you're out doing your solo shows, you've been doing these for a long time, but then going back to your roots of Black Sheep and singing those songs to a sold out show, how was that for you? I loved it. Uh, I've gotta be honest with you, I really loved it. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's most of the guys from from the original Black Sheep, uh, with a, with an exception of of, of um, Bruce Turgan, uh, our bass player, who, who couldn't make it. But uh, the the band band sounded. I mean, I mean, it gave me chills. It, it sounded to me just the way it used to sound. Oh wow! Yep, and, and you know, th those those songs. Uh, uh, there were some of them that were popular in in the in the northeastern part of the country, but but um, uh, uh, the audience was singing along, and it, it was it was just like playing uh, Midnight Blue or something, you know. Yeah, I was reading that they didn't want you guys to stop. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and and it was it was uh, we played two sold out shows in, in one night. Oh my gosh! Yep, and and uh, it was just awesome. It was just awesome, you know. Uh, um, and and we, you know, after after the shows were, we were hugging each other in the dressing room, and we promised that we're going to do this one more time. Great. You know, maybe in a year or two, and then we're going to put it to rest. But was it like you know, old hat, just going back to those songs, and they just came out of you? <clears throat> yes, they did. That is so cool. Yeah, it was it was really great. We had one rehearsal the day before, and, and uh, we ironed out a few bumps in the road, but mm -hmm. but there was it wasn't anything that was uh, uh, really a problem, and and uh, just just getting back in the saddle. Yeah, and Bruce, as you mentioned, Bruce Turgan, he was your co-writer with you on your solo career. That's right. He, we 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 wrote a lot of the songs on the Black Sheep albums, and and uh, we co-wrote a lot of the songs. On my solo albums. Now, Midnight Blue, my favorite. I've told you this so many times, but I, I love it. It is my favorite. What was the premise of that song, and where did the title come from? Um, I actually, uh, I, at that point in my life, I had a, a little house in Westchester County, uh, the town of Katona. And uh, it was an older house, and it had a small basement, and, and there was a little room in there where I set up my drum set. I set up uh, an electric piano, and I had a small amp and a guitar in there. And and uh, the 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 idea of the song just just came to me. And and uh, even though I knew it was a guitar song, um, such a poor guitar player that I figured out the chords on the electric piano. And I had a TX four track tape recorder, and I recorded the I recorded the keyboards and then I got on the drums and played the drums that was two of the four tracks then the third track I sang and the fourth track I left empty and then then uh, when Bruce came by one time I, I played him what I had and and he heard the, the the electric piano chords and he figured out the guitar chords yeah. uh, uh, with, with with the inversions that he liked that, that made those chords sound so special. And so that fourth track, he put the guitar on there, and although it was very rough, it, it, it was a complete song, and, and uh, I felt very good about it. And, 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 then, and, then, and then it, 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 it blossomed into, into the song that, that you know. And hence why you're in the Songwriters Hall of Fame as well, because th that song just is so, oh, it's just everything. <laughs> Can't even explain it. That, that, that song, I've, I've got the page from Billboard magazine from 1987. It was the number one most played single in the country 
over Can't Find What I'm Looking For by U2. There's a lot of, lot of great songs in the top. They had the top 10 list of the most songs played in Midnight Blue was number one. And that was all you. All you, which is amazing yeah, because you. you deserve it. Yeah, thank you. Now, a lot of people don't know Thomas Dolby was on the Four and a Four album. Yes, he was. And he did the massage music, as Dennis called it, at the beginning of Waiting for a Girl Like You. <laughs> yeah, massage, massage music. music. I mean, what That's do you... That's an interesting concept, isn't it? <laughs> what do you remember about Thomas? Well, that, that he, he was kind of quiet, but, 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 but he, you know, he, he's one of those ethereal guys that was very perceptive. And, and uh, you know, whatever it was that, that we kind of alluded to, Two that we were looking for. He, within a matter of uh, minutes, he he put his, literally put his fingers on it and and played what, what was perfect for the song, you know. And all those things he did in in uh, 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 waiting for a girl and, and things like that. And and even in jukebox hero, that's 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 him at the beginning of the song and throughout the song. Uh, he's he's a. He, he's a uh, quiet and, and interesting guy, a little eccentric, but but uh, but very nice, I thought, and and uh, just brilliant. And waiting for a girl like you spent ten weeks at number two. Yes. Incredible. Yep. So who was the girl behind that song? In the in the video, or you mean in the, stu in the, the studio? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who I was thinking about when I wrote it? Uh, I can't say. I can't say. Cut it out. I can't see. <gasps> There's a little secret inside of you. I love it. At, at, any, at any rate, though, <laughs> when, when I was singing the song in the studio, I was, we were actually doing the vocals. I was recording the song. And, and the, the song started playing, the intro started playing, and all of a sudden the studio door opens from, from, from outside the hallway. And, and this very, very attractive young woman comes in takes three steps down in front of the board the recording board there's a little sofa there and she sits in the sofa and she's looking at me while I'm singing the song so so for me that was a perfect opportunity to sing to her you know put a little more emotion into the song and, and she had a little shy smile on her face and she was very attractive and and as the song started ending and I was singing those those high notes as the song was fading out and stuff. She got up, she gave me a smile and she walked out the door. And and, and Mutt Lang and, and Mick were at the board up a little higher than her. And, and so when, when the song ended, I, I ran into the control room and I said, who is that girl? And they look at each other and they go, what girl? Oh, stop. That's what they did. I think they planned that J just to get a little more emotion out of me, but they, they also deserved an Academy Award because they were like, what girl? Yeah. <laughs> did you ever see that girl again? I never did. Never found out who she was. <gasps> oh my gosh, like the biggest secret in rock history now. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest little secret. <laughs> Mutt Lang, he produced four. Yes, he did. And the hits that came out of that album were just incredible. What spiciness do you think Mutt added to that album for you guys? Well, he, he, he's a very creative guy. He, uh, I think he honestly had a lot to do with resurrecting the career of ACDC, which had a great career already, but, but after Bon Scott passed away, uh, um, uh, they they it was a, they had a little lull, and 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 they were determined to make a make a, a, a great album, uh, and they they wrote great songs, and, and and much production I think really helped to make um, I think Back in Black uh, uh, a huge album for them, and um, as far as Foreigner went, we we. We had come off of Head Games, which I thought was a good album, but was not received that well be, because um, there was some misconceptions about the the uh, album cover being very risque. They thought, you know, uh, a young girl in a boy's bathroom wiping her phone number, name and phone number off off the the wall, and and uh, and then the first 
single was uh, Dirty White Boy, I believe, and and uh, so so the the um, the in in the mid in the Midwest in the Bible Belt, uh, uh, it, it was we were pretty much uh, banned on radio, and in certain other sections in Boston, we 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 were not played. Really? And some other, you know, just just because they had determined that between the the cover of the album and the first single, that 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 we were we had overstepped an imaginary line, and and uh, and and uh, we we well, there was there was an article in in uh, in in my local paper, the Rochester, New York paper, showing showing a a uh, big bonfire. Somewhere in the Midwest, and people were burning all their foreigner albums. Oh my gosh! Yeah, uh, it, Shame it, on them. It, it was it was uh, so far blown out of control, you know, uh, uh, and it, it 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 put a very negative slant on the band, and and uh, the tour didn't go as well as as the earlier tours, and and the sales of the album were were substantially off. So, so you know, after after that album had completely died out, we we Mick and I had had meetings, and we were very concerned that that uh, that that negativity would would carry over into our next album, and and we knew that we had to to make an album that was uh, uh, very different and and uh, and and more or less. Uh, um, uh, uh, Regarnered our audience back to us again, and, and you sure did. Yes, we did, you and, sure and did. with with much help, we, we did that. Yes. Now, music catalog sales—that has been—I mean, it's always been a thing, but the past few years, it's been a really big thing. Bruce Springsteen sold his catalog, yeah. Rod Stewart, and now Queen records record selling catalog for 1.27 billion. Mm -hmm. Is this something you have considered? And Den Dennis Elliott, he sold his portion yes. of the catalog. So is there, you know, something you have been thinking about with regards to um, that? Uh, it's crossed my mind and, and I've had I've had uh, companies and people calling me asking me if I wanted to sell my, my my portion of the songs and, and uh, I hadn't really thought about it that much, but but I have been thinking about it and and um, I I don't know if songs won't be worth that much in the future. Maybe now's the time to do it if you're going to do it. I'm not sure, but but I I, I want to leave um, that 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 creativity and and, and any any funds that it generates to my children mm -hmm. absolutely i mean take it while the iron's hot right yeah, you know? and and uh, you know that that's that's something that 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 forever in their lives and their children's lives that that they they can remember their dead absolutely you know? absolutely now you said that this is it this is the last year you're retiring you said this back in 2017 but it has to be hard to really make that decision to say, this is it, I'm not doing the road thing anymore. Is this for real this it, time? It is, it, it's, you know, I, I still enjoy performing, but, 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 but it, it, you know, be, being that I'm not, not, not the kid I once was, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, uh, um, more difficult, more, 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 exerting and and um, and a lot of it also has to do with the the um, the, the way travel has become is is ridiculous you know uh, it used to be so easy to fly to one city to another not not now now flights are canceled for no reason at all and and people are left stranded and and, and uh, you know I, I've, I've had flights where I booked Book the first class seat and, and end up on the last aisle of the plane next to the oh. next to the back bathrooms, uh, uh, just because as as they they give me my boarding pass, it's not the one that I that I booked, you know. But it's either take that seat or or, or miss your flight and maybe miss a show, you know. Right. 
So I get on very, very begrudgingly, and I the whole flight I just sit there and see, because because uh, you know they the 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 airlines used to be very very professional and and, and very very good at what they do, and and, and things that things seem to be uh, uh, upside down, and, and 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 there's no no reason for what's going on yeah. that, that I can I can. I can see, and uh, I I just prefer prefer not to travel. So, what will you do with all your free time? Obviously, not travel. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a I have a small home in Florida that I I get out of the Rochester winters, mm-hmm. you know, and I go there for three four months, uh, and uh, I enjoy that. I fly there, but but uh, you know, I'll gr- grin and bear it. And it's not every flight; it's just every, every so often yeah. that, that that kind of thing happens. But it's very, very upsetting to me when that does. So, so you know, I, I, I have, um, I'm, I'm a classic car collector. N- not, not I have a big collection. I have three or four cars, but, but I, I've had them for 25 or 30 years now. And I go to cruise nights and car shows and stuff. That's, that, that's my, my, um, my. Outlet. Uh, outlet, yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure I'm still going to be writing songs and maybe recording, but I, I think I've just had enough of touring. Right, you know, right. I, I've been doing this for almost 50 years now, and, and uh, that's Incredible. a long time. Incredible. So, Lou, you have always spoken so highly of your parents, and they brought music into your yes, life. They did. You've been through so much in your life, positive, you've had your health scare, you know, now you're back and people are in the audience, woo, 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 like it's, they are just it's loving a, it's awesome. you. It gives me chills when I hear that. And now you're finally getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What do you think your parents would say to you today if they were here? Well, oh, I'm, I'm sure they, they'd... Uh congratulate me for working so hard and sticking to it um, and uh, although I, I know when, when um, my, my life in music started to take off that they, they they insisted that I temper that with at least a two-year college degree which, which I, I did I did get yeah, they they wanted me to have a backup in case music fell through because it's 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 such a it's such a uh, hit and miss career you know you know they didn't they didn't want to see me doing twenty five or thirty years playing clubs or whatever you know? right and, and um, I understood that so so I did I did get my two year degree and and. Uh, Therefore, if, if music fell through as a livelihood, I, I had only to do two more years, and I had, I'd have a, a, a good degree. And, and uh, I had been, I had plans to be a, a history teacher wow. if music fell through. I was I was way into American history, and um, I enjoyed it. And and uh, I would have been okay with that as a career. I thought I thought the idea of teaching was pretty pretty cool. Which is something you can still do. Could could do, uh, um, and uh, yeah. So that was kind of that was kind of they they in, they just instilled a, a lot of things in me that that uh, they thought were important uh, from growing up in the depression era. Oh yeah, lots of lessons. Yes. Lots of lessons. I heard lots of stories too. I'm sure you did. Well, Lou, we thank you so much for, you know, again, sharing some of your precious time. I, I, I have to tell you, so every time before I talk to you, I have to go and watch my Lou videos. And it just brings me back. And to sit here with you is just such a, like a crazy moment for me. And you literally are the icon of my generation. You were the male singer of the 80s. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. And love, love, love everything you've done. And just know that, not just me, but like millions of people around the world are That's grateful awesome. for you. Very, very grateful. I appreciate grateful. that a lot. Thank you so much. So thank you, Lou. 
Hi, I'm Lou Graham. You're listening to New England's classic hits music station, Kiki.fm. Great. I pretend you like me. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I know, I know.